meant to overcome whatever objections the master had. These objections, in fact, are not made clear even to Niccolò in the letter. In fact, they, and not the sexual come on, are the subject that is too delicate to be communicated uh, publicly. Which brings us to Michelangelo's response. Rinuncio a questa consolazione e non la voglio torre a lui. What it's not, of course, is anything like a righteously indignant denial that offers of this kind might be of interest to him. It seems rather, from the practiced nature of the expression, that he has quite a lot of experience with this situation. And he's formulated a language for it that has a parodic relation to the vocabulary of Petrarchism, where consolazione is what the lover euphemistically longs for from the beloved, and where the idea of seizing something from her him is, slightly less euphemistically, associated with the loss of sexual innocence. None of which, to be sure, places Michelangelo in some kind of consensual world of sexual polymorphous perversity, but it can stand as a version of what one 16th century genius talked about when he talked about homosexuality. Now in terms of the last and briefest of my vignettes, under the title of Translation, Parenthesis, Comparative Literature. It may not have gone unnoticed that there has been something deliberately literalist about my examples of work in trans. Regarding word and image, I gave you an image in which words were being written. Uh, regarding alternative sexualities, I focused on the names rather than the acts. For this last vignette, I turn to the center of my own professional identity, comparative literature. I take it in its simplest sense and as involving multiple languages. And rather than moving between one nation and another, or one author and another, I offer, again, the literal instance of some places in Shakespeare's plays where he actually introduces foreign languages on stage. And he does it a number of times. In The Merry Wives of Windsor, for instance, young William Page is being instructed in the time-honored principles of Lily's Latin grammar. Shakespeare's staging of elementary Latin instruction, including the declension of nouns, the forms of the demonstrative pronoun hic haec hoc, and the translation of simple words like lapis and pulcher, locates it between, on the one hand, the pedagogue, Sir Hugh Evans, and on the other hand, the potty-mouthed bystanders, Mistress Quickly, or Quick Lies, as well. Both of them turn out to be linguistic black holes in space. Uh, Sir Hugh speaks in a thick Welsh accent, which turns English itself into something barely comprehensible. And Mistress Quickly, who is devoid, obviously, of anything like a grammar school education, misconstrues classical Latin and turns it into very colloquial English indeed. The many double meanings reach a climax when, in uh, Sir Hugh's uh, Welsh pronunciation, uh, vocative becomes vocative. See where we're going here. Uh, uh, one thing leads to another. Uh, uh, there is no vocative case for the demonstrative pronoun. Uh, in other words, it is lacking, or in Latin, caret. That, in turn, becomes carrot which, according to Mistress Quicklight, is a good root. Um, and what kind of root becomes clear when we get to genitive and the forms of horum, harum, horum. <laughs> Too good to be true. We'll get back to that. There's another Latin lesson in Taming of the Shrew. Hortensio and Lucencio are fighting over Bianca and have disguised themselves as a music teacher and a grammar teacher, respectively. The text for the grammar lesson is from, is from the first of Ovid's Heroities, and I should say there's always a penchant in all of this for the beginnings of works, because that's as far as most readers ever got in reading them. Uh, and in this case, it's, it's the beginning of a passage in the first of the Heroities describing uh, the citadel of Troy. Hic ibat simulis, hic est sigea telus, hic stetera priami regia celsa senis, here ran the simulis, here is the Sagean ground, here, aged Priam's lofty palace used to stand. But that's not the English we get it. Lucentio breaks it down such that what counts as preposterous translation delivers a quite different message. Hic ibat, as I told you before, simulis I am Lucentio, hic est son unto Lucentio Pisa, sigea tellus disguised thus to gain love, hic stetera, and that Lucentio that comes a wooing, Priami is my man Trani, regia bearing my boy. Tells us that we might beguile the old pantaloon. <laughs> to which Bianca replies in a similar vein, uh, though it should be noted that her mastery of the Latin phraseology is superior to Lucentio's. 
Now let me see if I can construe it. Hic ibat simus, I know you not. Hic est sigeitelis, I trust you not. Hic stetere priam, take heed he hear us not. Regia presume not, kelsa senis despair not. She does, after all, keep the logical phrases together. On one level, at least, <clears throat> these lessons signal a self-consciousness about how language works in the world. Shakespeare lives, after all, in an interesting time as regards European speech, when vernaculars are being solidified as national languages. Perhaps it's even more the case that he lives in an interesting place, um, a relatively remote outpost off the coast of all this high-status, self-canonizing polyglossia. His island has, in the first place, its own politically charged uh, problem of multiple languages, and in the second place, it suffers from anxiety and alienation as regards the linguistic prestige available on the continent, as well as across the millennium that separates the early moderns from the ancients. <clears throat> in fact, the two plays with Latin lessons stand in an interesting relation to each other. Merry Wives is surely Shakespeare's most self-consciously English piece of comedic production, whereas Taming may be his most careful effort at crafting uh, an authentically Italianate dramatic milieu. On his side of the chapel, <clears throat> it is perhaps inevitable that the local problem of language, the English versus the Welsh, should rub up against the grand European drama of language, and that this should take place in the context of a very primitive phase of foreign language education. On the other side of the channel, where we graduate from a beginning Latin class to advanced readings in Ovid, or in that course, um, the cultural drama is more intricate. It is significant that the passage Shakespeare chooses is already a piece of ventriloquism. Maybe I'll put it back here. Uh, so we have that. That's, that's the beyond um, the uh, That the um, um, uh, that the passage Shakespeare chooses is already a piece of ventriloquism. The quotation is from Penelope's letter to Ulysses, as she is imagining some hypothetical other husband who, unlike hers, has succeeded in returning from the Trojan War and now begins to narrate his battle experience. So she is speaking as though it were an imaginary person who is a substitute for her husband who has not returned. Which in turn allows Bianca, the women being, being nearly always smarter than the men in romantic comedies, as we see here, to shape or misshape the Ovidian passage into a complete piece of comedic flirtation at once fending off Lucentio's blunt and inept perform performance as a Latin lover, get it, um, uh, uh, while at the same time delivering her, delivering him via her more subtle mistranslation into a state of exquisite uncertainty about his chances with her. Um, I know you're not, I trust you not. That's, that's a no, <laughs> that's a no. Uh, take heed he hear us not, that's a little more like a yes. Uh, presume not, that's a no. Despair not, that's a yes. Uh, so she produces a very subtle piece of this translation. Uh, no question uh, uh, that, the, uh, <clears throat> that the matter of multiple languages and their respective prestige or political significance shines through these foreign language scenes, as it does as well when Glendower's daughter speaks and sings in Welsh in Henry IV, Part One, <clears throat> or when an entire scene is performed in French before the Battle of Agincourt in Henry V. But there's another issue here that transcends the political map, which we can glimpse uh, through a strand of jokes in many of these scenes. Channeled through Mistress Quickly, foreign words immediately become smutty words. The same kind of thing happens at the other end of the social scale uh, between Princess Catherine and her maid when the English words she is learning, uh, which are uh, uh, turn into filthy French. Uh, uh, gown, <laughs> cold. Uh, and foot, foot, and again, uh, no surprises there. Um, uh, or at a loftier level, when Glendower's non Welsh speaking son in law uh, says he understands the love being expressed by his wife, even though they do not share a language. What Shakespeare is exploring here is not only the uh, errancy of linguistic morphology, that is, the fact that when one says, that one says le coude, uh, like in one language, an elbow in another, but more vitally, the errancy of meaning. Uh, whether between or within languages, a point brought home more radically uh, by a foreign language seen in All's Well That Ends Well, but you'll see that foreign language isn't quite the right term. A cowardly braggart, loosely attached to the army, has boasted that he will receive a battle, that, that, that he will retrieve a battle drum that has fallen into enemy hands. A group of his fellow military men 
in order to expose his true spinelessness, pretend that they are enemy soldiers. And they seize him while speaking to him in what turns out to be a made-up language. 